All right, guys, Cody here. I uh, had a question the other day about a more operational question. And uh, so I think I'm going to start kind of answering some of those uh, to the best of my ability without giving up, you know, any OPSEC or anything. But the question is, uh, what threats do you generally face on a protection detail? And I had previously spoke about uh, threats are just different types of incidences that happen at, at, uh, US, at U.S. embassies or consulates. And so I thought it'd be a good idea to talk a little bit about uh, what you might face on a protection detail. And what I'll tell you is it, it depends. There's a, there's a number of factors into what you might face. Um, depends on who you're protecting, uh, the location of where you're protecting that individual, the size of your motorcade. If I'm protecting someone in Iraq, it's obviously different than if I'm protecting someone in New York. If I'm protecting the Iranian foreign minister in Washington, D.C., it's different than if I'm than if I'm protecting the Vietnamese foreign minister in Idaho, so on and so forth. Because, well, for a number of reasons. One, the threat environment or the security environment in, in DC would be more significant than in Idaho, for example. Uh, the size of your motorcade. So uh, some motorcades get what's called an escort detail, which is a, a, a smaller, uh, not a full detail. And then of course, uh, high threat details get not just uh, a full detail, but they also get add-ons like a counter-assault team. Um, so when I discuss this, uh, it's going to be primarily with DS. I'm not talking about like doing executive protection for a, a movie star because then you just face a whole number of threat, different different types of, uh, of threats or, or executive protection for a CEO. Not as many threats, but still some uh, and a different type of threat. So mainly uh, the... Uh, what I'm going to get at is, is diplomatic security uh, protection details. So I have some notes here, so I'm going to kind of go off screen here and there. Um, DS mission is to provide a safe and secure environment for the conduct of diplomacy. So uh, remember that if you go to apply for the for the uh, for the position. Um, and so that doesn't. It, oftentimes you think, well, the conduct of diplomacy, U.S. diplomacy overseas, true. However, diplomats from other countries come over to the U.S foreign dignitaries, uh, particularly uh, uh, the foreign ministers, which is the equivalent of our Secretary of State, is a foreign dignitary. Uh, I, I'm sorry, is a diplomat. So the conduct of their, their diplomacy matters as well because we would like to think they're on our turf, on our soil, to uh, have some type of diplomatic activity with the U.S. Um, so the smaller mission, particularly of, the, of a protection detail, is to prevent harm and embarrassment. So whoever you're protecting, your two objectives are to prevent harm and embarrassment. Now, what is harm? Harm could be a number of things. There's a, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, well, both harm and embarrassment can be a number of things. Let's talk about embarrassment first. Um, some of you may remember Secretary Clinton was stepping down some steps into her motorcade at one point and she stepped off and she fell. She tripped and fell. That's embarrassment, right? That's something that a DS agents could have potentially mitigated. Whether you're the advance agent walking and say, watch your step, ma'am, uh, you point it out to her or him, or you're the uh, ship leader or AIC who's right next to her that might hold her, catch her up, they're gonna blame the protection detail. I personally don't think that is the protection detail's fault, but you know that's, that's one of the things we try to mitigate while we're on these details. Another embarrassing uh, thing would be um, well, in, I believe this is happening in, in Europe where individuals were throwing milkshakes uh, on people. And there's a video online if you look at milkshake throwing on, I believe it's like a British parliament member or, or I forget who. But they're basically walking in an area, in a down, maybe a downtown area, and a guy walks up, he's drinking a milkshake, and he throws it on him. Well, that's embarrassing, right? And those guys, uh, the protection details should have caught that. They should have seen that. Um, easy to have second... I mean, second, what's it, second string quarterback, next day quarterback, Monday morning quarterback. Um, but those are the types of things that, that you want to look for for embarrassment. Harm also comes in a number of uh, different uh, shapes and sizes. Um, but when you're talking about um, DS motorcades or protection details, we don't necessarily operate like the Secret Service does. We do in some cases. I mean, the, the basics of our motorcades and our protection details are the same. However, most people think of presidential protection detail when they think of Secret Service, in which they have unlimited resources, unlimited money, personnel. They can shut down everything around them. Uh, you know, nearly every site or big events will have metal detectors, and you can search people. And 
regular DS protection details, we don't have that ability. Secretary of State's detail has a little bit of that, but still not even close to the level what presidential um, protection detail does. So oftentimes, if it is a higher high threat protection detail, if it is Secretary of State, we will rely on the local venue to supply or to assist us. Sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. But if you have a hotel that may have in stock or in the stash a, a metal detector, if we can utilize that because the threat warrants it, then then we would, but we don't have the capacity or the money to generally bring uh, you know, all these resources and walk through metal detectors and hand, hand metal detectors and all these different elements. So I am talking about DS protection details. Where we operate, I like to think we're better because we operate with real threats. Now, what are real threats? So let's talk about motorcade threats real, real quick. All right, motorcades are, are generally made up. You have a police lead, so you rely on the local police uh, force to provide a police lead. Um, sometimes you'll have what's called a, uh, well, just a lead car for DS, but usually we kind of get rid of that and then we just do it with the police lead. We have a guy that's called, a guy or girl, an agent that's called lead right front. So they'll ride in the back of the police car and they will kind of be calling next moves where we going left, going right, you know, switching lanes, freaking taking next exit, all that shit. Um, and then you have the, you have, uh, well, you have a couple other vehicles and um, you might have a, a, a limo, obviously you're gonna have a limo. Um, you might have a spare limo and you'll always have a follow vehicle. Um, and the follow vehicle is where the majority of the agents of the detail are. So they are the protective unit, although the limo has an agent in charge, but the majority of agents are in the follow vehicle and that's the guys and girls you see jump out of the vehicle and go surround the limo when, uh, you know, when you, when you get to, uh, to, to your site. Um, so when you're in these motor, okay. And then, and then oftentimes, depending on who you're protecting, you almost always have a staff vehicle. That's not a DS, uh, uh, vehicle, but it's kind of our responsibility because behind that usually is a, well, sometimes hopefully is a police follow, right? So that kind of makes up the detail that you have a, a marked police car in the front. You have a marked police car in the back and everything in between kind of tells people on the highway, don't come into our motorcade. Um, and then those staff vehicles, you can have one, you might have freaking 15. I don't know. It just depends on who you're protecting. Uh, and staff vehicles can have anything from the protectees assistant to, to, uh, you know, some of their, they bring sometimes their, 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 uh, uh, agents or bodyguards. Um, they'll bring, uh, sometimes they'll have press. Sometimes we'll have press, uh, that might go in those vehicles. And those are just staff vehicles that we try to keep the continuity of the, of the, uh, of the motorcade, but the primary responsibility is that limo and that follow because limos who's driving, it's a DS agent driving, by the way, um, a trained DS agent, of course, they're all trained, uh, and then the follow. And, and, and those, those are the two primary vehicles that, that if there were some type of contact, some type of event, uh, where, uh, there was a, a scenario in which they needed to escape or, uh, you know, uh, kind of, uh, mitigate some type of threat, then those two, the, the follow vehicles is, has to be with the limo. Um, so what are some motorcade threats? Someone, if, if you're in Iraq, right, your motorcade threats are a lot different. In domestically, you're looking more at things like what I'm about to, this list I'm about to give you. Someone running a stoplight, right? So you're clear, you're green. Uh, we generally, depending on the, the motorcade, we generally don't just blast through red lights. If you're sex state detail in DC, they may shut down for you, but otherwise uh, you're gonna stop at stoplights. Or if it's a yellow and lead right front, police lead says, hey, drive through, then we drive through. And what if someone is, is, uh, is, is, is running the red light or vice versa, right? Or, or if you're passing through uh, on a green light on, and somebody just smashes through a stop sign or a stoplight. Uh, that's, that's the type of threat. So those are the things that guys and girls in the follow vehicle, the follow car driver and the shift leader needs to be aware of, uh, drunk drivers, obviously an issue, curious drivers. Sometimes you're going down the highway, whether you have lights and sirens on or not, people are pulling up like who the fuck is in this vehicle, right? And so they can get dangerous. You might have someone in the vehicle who's curious and drunk. Well, now you got a problem on your hands. You could have someone hanging out the window, taking pictures, flashing you. 
I've seen it all. We've all seen it all. It's a, there's a number of things that could happen that you need to be aware of. Uh, panic drivers. This happens pretty often. If you're if you're in 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 the far left lane and and the motorcades are trying to take over and we're trying to pass and you're going too slow and then we hit the lights and sirens, whether it be the police lead or or the suburbans. Um, People panic sometimes, and I bet you firemen and police officers can tell you this all the time. People panic. They hear the, the lights and sirens. They don't know what to do. If they're not going fast, they're on a, they're on a, a, a highway that's really packed, uh, they they kind of panic and don't know what to do. So that is, that's another issue. Uh, angry drivers. You come in, you cut them off, or maybe you, you, you're, you're stopping traffic. Maybe there's police along your route that are stopping traffic for you, and this pisses people off. So they catch up to you, and they're angry, and they're flipping you off, and they might be threatening to drive in. These are the types of things that you'll, that, that you'll face more often than some type of attack on a motorcade, again, domestically. Um, so, yeah, the probability of someone having a weapon and pulling it out on, on your protectee while driving or at all domestically or, or, or slim. Uh, so let's move on to potential threats. So I'm gonna talk about threats, uh, I'm sorry, p potential threats on venue, not on the motorcade. Uh, and, that, and I'm saying threats while the protectee is present because all advanced agents know you're out, when you're an advanced agent, um, and this is an agent I didn't talk about, but basically anywhere we go, just about anywhere we go, we're gonna have someone there in advance. And they're gonna be there a while in advance. And they're gonna have seen that place and know that place and know the ins and outs of all of that freaking place. I still do that now as an EP, as an executive protection for the CEO here. I go and I learn every place that he's gonna go to and I go well in advance. I meet all the key personnel there. Uh, I know where AEDs are. I know where entries and exits and hard rooms and bathrooms and routes and drops and parking. And I know all, uh, you learn all of that. And that's all stuff that an advance agent would do. Um, but I'm talking particularly threats when uh, the protectee is on venue. Um, one of them that I've seen a lot, well, I'll say the first two are the first, the ones I've seen the most. Angry individuals because you stopped pedestrian traffic or vehicle traffic in the area. So say you're rolling up to New York. I remember a specific event. We rolled up. It was New York. It was the area where were really crowded streets, which I think they're almost all crowded streets. Some areas like on 6th and uh, 52nd aren't as they're bigger, but really crowded area. We had a motorcade, a sizable motorcade, nothing too big, but we stopped traffic. We got caught up in it. You know, we, we jumped out and we, we stopped pedestrian traffic. We stopped vehicle traffic and our protect the, I don't know if he's on the phone or whatever, but it took a while to get out. So now we're just holding these people up. And sometimes you gotta make a decision to say, I'll let these go, these people go, let them pass because what's, what's more of a threat, right? Pissed off people or can you hold for a second in the limo and let people pass so that those pissed off people are gone now? Um, but anyway, people get angry and they might threaten you. They might threaten your protectee. They might just become curious and be like, who is that? And they start asking questions. And generally, you don't want to tell people who it is, right? Um, belligerent people walking by your motorcade that are just maybe they're drunk. Uh, maybe they see you parked outside of a venue. Generally, you don't want to park on top of the venue. You might get your limo on top of it so that in case you need to bug out of there pretty quick, you could uh, get out of there. But you want to you want to try to keep a lower profile when you're at particular venues. So you might park a block down the street or something so they don't know exactly where your protectee is. Um, homeless drunks and EDPs or homeless and drunks are considered EDPs. EDPs are emotionally disturbed people. So you hear that on, in your earpiece sometimes. Like, hey, got an EDP, white male, crazy fucking hair, drinking a beer, saying that he wants to. Uh, we had some people, uh, oh man, there's so many. Uh, I forget the last one in New York, but it was a guy that was, was saying he was a millionaire uh, and he owned the restaurants on the block, yet he was pushing a cart that, that where all his belongings were. And we actually learned from the, local, the, the New York police officers that you don't threaten them with arrest, uh, or you threaten them with getting the uh, uh, with like the medical services to pick them up because they're emotionally disturbed. And if you get medical service, there's some type of distinct distinction there where they'll take everything you have, so they'll never get it back. So these guys has a cart full of clothes and items they picked up from wherever, and they'll never see that back. So the cops came. We called in the EDP. The, uh, the local cops came. They're not in uniform, but they are local cops. And they communicated to the guy that, hey, we're going to call the wagon or whatever, and you're going to get picked up, and you're going to lose everything. And the guy cursed at us, flipped us off, and said he's a millionaire. And 
you know, I didn't get his business card. Maybe I should have. Maybe I could be a millionaire too. But uh, those types of things. Protesters. So you don't see a lot of... I haven't had too many protesters on our... I don't think any on most of my protection details. Again, because DS kind of rolls really low profile. That said, uh, during the United Nations General Assembly, which has happened September, October-ish in New York, there's always protests. They're everywhere. Yeah, and, and they're generally pinned protests, right? So some, some will pop up, but the bigger ones are often pinned in a certain area. Protest is there. Oftentimes, the Iranian foreign minister. There's these uh, Chinese protesters that come out couple of Vietnamese protesters here and there, uh, Turkish protesters. Um, you'll have them, there's all shapes and sizes of protesters out there. Those could become a threat, obviously, uh, if they become rowdy. That said, compared to the protests we've had recently, when Americans protesting uh, against the government or whatever cause they choose to, uh, these protesters are generally more contained and uh, uh, a lot more peaceful. You, you don't see riots or anything. You might get something thrown at you, not you, but at your detail. Um, and, uh, you know, and generally at UNGA, the, the protests are pinned and, and it's near the United Nations. They want to allow them some type of access, but it's not like right on top of the United Nations. And, you know, we have it set up to where there's just cops and motorcades everywhere. When you're posted up and your protectees doing their thing, uh, you have enough support to, if there were to be an issue, that somebody could come to your aid pretty quick. And I, I've done that before. I went to the they called on the radio that they were doing a walking move and uh, they needed some bodies. And so a couple of us jumped out and we went just post up along the path just to be eyes. Again, uh, soft skills, threat recognition is what is what we're talking about. And that's what's finally important. Um, so, no, jumped ahead. What's important? Well, soft skills. And uh, what are soft skills? Well, let's talk about what hard skills are. Your hard skills are your, uh, well shooting a weapon, drawing your weapon, engaging a threat with lethal force uh, or non-lethal force, though, or you know, fighting or with your baton or something like that, or even with pepper spray. Those are your hard skills. The chances of using those in a protection detail, particularly pulling your firearm, domestic protection detail, are very freaking slim, very slim. So what's important? Your soft skills, your threat recognition. There's a reason I went post up along the route of where the walking path of it wasn't the Iranian foreign minister because those guys actually have a different method, but it was someone that was going in an area where there was significant protest. Um, and so your, your, your eyes are what help you, your, your knowledge and your ability to recognize threat. So there's threat recognition and there's threat mitigation, right? You recognize a threat and then you determine a way to mitigate that threat. Uh, and sometimes it could be just leaving, just getting out of there or de-escalating. If you see a threat, you're talking to a guy that tends to escalate, you try to de-escalate. But there's one element that's that, that's missing, threat recognition, threat mitigation. In the middle, I like to say threat anticipation. I need to anticipate what that threat might do. So I look at the guy, I see high, eyes, hands, uh, body language, apparel. I compare that to my current location, uh, you know, uh, to the weather, to uh, the, the um, what else? Uh, well, the people around the event that's current that's taking place and i compare a number of these uh things to my own knowledge of what should be happening or what's abnormal or what's normal and what's abnormal and then i determine if that is a threat and what that threat might actually do right if it's a guy that has a bulge right right here uh on his hip you know and it, and if, you know maybe it's 90 degree weather and they're wearing a black trench coat and you can still see the bulge. That's a big deal, right? Uh, and he's, you know, pacing back and forth and his eyes are really intense. I and mean, this is a dramatic example, but 90 degrees out wearing that, you see that, what might that guy do? Well, he looks like he might be armed. Uh, if he is armed, what's the worst, what's the, what consequences could, could happen there? You know, and there's a number of things you could do to mitigate that. You know, you can have uh, the police go question him, right? You can do a Terry stop. You can go question him. Oftentimes we get the locals involved, but you could go question them. Um, you could use a back door when you leave because you think that guy might, might present a threat and the cops said, well, we can't do anything about it. Um, you can hold, hold in place. There's a number of things you can do. This is actually the threat mitigation, threat recognition, all that sh is going to, should be a whole new video. And if anyone's, if anyone's interested in me going into detail into what DS agents look for and how we look for it, 
Um, I actually used to give personal safety and security courses in which I trained people uh, on soft skills to uh, determine what a threat is. And this is when, uh, a couple years ago, when active shooters were prevalent, serious um, issue. And so I was teaching people how to recognize uh, threats based on what a special agent or a federal agent uh, in a protection capacity, DS agents, Secret Service agents, um, based on, on that skill set. So anyway, long video this time. I haven't done it in a while, but I hope that was of interest to you. If it is, you know, like like it on YouTube, tell your friends about it. Um, a couple things. The podcast is up. I've been telling you about it for weeks. It's finally up. Uh, uh, episode. I did two episodes so far. The things I talked about uh, uh, that occur at embassies oftentimes you're going to get more intel from these podcasts than anything else. And I say it in the, at, the, at the beginning of this next podcast that I just did, uh, that, uh, you know, the security management piece of the three duties of, uh, of, of DS, which are protection, investigations, and security management. Um, the security management piece is often the less appealing than the other two. And I, and I ended up loving it. And it's because you deal with so many different things. So I would encourage people, if you're, if you're interested in uh, joining DS or just interested in learning how uh, the U.S. government protects their diplomats overseas, uh, listen to these podcasts because it's going to open your world up. Um, and the first two have been really great. I'm hoping to get a third one out in the, let's see, next week. And, uh, you know, we'll go from there. So it's called the Off the X Podcast. It's on Apple. Uh, just type in my name, Cody Perron, or if you type off the X podcast, I think it'll come up. I did it on my wife's phone yesterday, and it worked. On my phone, it did, because I keep doing it often. Um, also on my website, CodyPerron.com. You can buy my books there, podcasts. I have a couple blogs. I need to pick that up again. But CodyPerron.com is, is where you can listen to it. It's on a, it's on, it's on a, a platform called Podbean. So if you don't, if you don't have Apple uh, you know, podcast, then just go to the website, and you can just play it. Um, I'm trying to get it on Google. I've had some trouble so far doing that. I've pinged their customer service to help me out. So it'll be on there. Um, I wrote a book. That's what started all of this. That's one of the reasons I'm doing all these things is, uh, you know, to, to not only help people because I've been in your situation and uh, it sucks. There's not a lot of information out there on DS, but also to pr promote a book. I'm not completely unselfish. Uh, I have a family to raise. And I'm trying to make a little bit of money on the side because I live in California and it's expensive. Um, so the book is uh, doing really well. 94 reviews right now. About 3,000 copies sold. All uh, primarily like 91% five-star reviews. The rest are four-star reviews uh, on Amazon. Um, have an audio book that's out. Um, and you can get it on Kindle. So, uh, it, you know, if you just go to Amazon and Google it or and type it in the search, you'll find it. Or if you go to my website, CodyParon.com, there's links to, uh, to get it. If it's Audible and you haven't listened to Audible, uh, it's your, if it's your first book, it'll be free. So, you know, you download the app. I don't think it requires you to put a credit card in. So you just download the app, listen to the book for free, and you're golden. So check it out. It's called Agents Unknown. Agents Unknown. I think by now, if you watch the other videos, you'll you'll know that. Um, I am active on social media, primarily Instagram, Agents Unknown underscore book. Um, I'm on Twitter a little bit. I'm on Facebook. There is a Facebook group if you're interested in learning, uh, in, in building a community with aspiring DS agents, current DS agents, people in training, uh, uh, then you are welcome to join the Facebook group. It's uh, uh, called Becoming a DSS Agent. So just, just call it and, you know, go from there. Um, yeah, that's... Uh, well, I think that's it. So thanks, everyone, for your time and support. If you got any questions, hit me up on Instagram. Hit me up on uh, YouTube. Uh, email me, info at CodyParon.com, and I will do whatever I can to help you out. Thanks, y'all. Out.